So, getting into the real mid-game maps here, we are at Blood Tide Coast today. In this video, we're going to be doing 100% map completion, show you guys how to get that, while discussing some of the lore of the area, some of the comparisons to Guild Wars 1, and also just general memories of my time here over the franchise. Maybe prompt some of your guys too, which you're happy to leave in the comments. Footage was submitted by TechZoon. So, let's jump on in. Now, this map is probably one of my favourites. Big... Uh, opposition to Dredge Haunt, which we did in the previous part, uh, because I have a lot of happy memories on this one due to a particular Living World Season 1 update I mentioned a bit in the Lornars Pass episode, and that was the release of the Triple Trouble Worm. I'll broach that topic in uh, more detail when we actually get a bit further south into those areas, but I've spent a ton of time on Blood Time Tide. Another reason I really like this map is its aesthetic. I'm a sucker for beachy, uh, summery, nice water-filled areas, palm trees, sands, all that kind of good stuff. And well, this is probably the happiest map in the game that demonstrates that kind of environment. Now, in Guild Wars 1, there were a lot of white sand beaches and, you know, palm trees and that kind of stuff. So it's nice as a continuation of the Guild Wars 1 aesthetic for Kryter to get this map here in Guild Wars 2. But it, even then, it does feel kind of different. You know, in Guild Wars 1, they were really, really broad, long, sand-swept beaches that were very white and actually were filled with, like, sh um, wreckages of ships. Now, in theory, in the lore, there's a good reason for those ships not to be there anymore. And of course, there was a giant tidal wave that flooded all of this at one point. A massive tsunami. You can imagine that throughout this entire video. As long as it is, all of it could have been swept under by water that destroyed the old Lion's Arch. And with it, would have probably moved all those ships. Then later, as pirates, pirates were rebuilding the town, and eventually it became a city, they kind of grabbed all that flotsam and all those materials to build, cobble something together. And that's why Lion's Arch looks like it did at launch before, you know, it was destroyed again and recreated again. So I think that, yes, there's a good reason for those ships not to be there, but I do kind of miss them. I miss the bigger white sand beaches and I miss the ships. And to tell you the truth, as much as I like this kind of environment, I much prefer it to be more vacation-y. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Because the truth is, Blood Tide Coast is quite an oppressive, scary place. In the story of Guild Wars 2, it's swarmed with Risen. We're actually now starting to travel towards Ore. All the rest of the maps that will appear in this playlist, with the exception of a couple of the Char ones, and I suppose actually Frost Gorge. We're, we're generally on a trend down south now. This is where most of the main story takes you uh, towards the Elder Undead Dragon. And the Risen forces just build up and up and up. I think that ArenaNet might have jumped the gun. Oh, by the way, this heart that we're doing here. Nice little example of some ghosts that are human but not related to the faux fire. Kind of ghostly pirate treasure themed event here. I would have rather seen more of um, hearts like this than the amount of Risen stuff. I think the devs might have jumped the gun just a little bit, adding as much Risen influence immediately south of Lion's Arch as they did. Because Guild Wars 2 does have a problem in the later game areas, and through most of the personal story after level 30, frankly, where you're just constantly fighting against Risen, which do change in title, like they have different nameplates, and sometimes even different models, but generally there's not like a progression of them getting stronger or scarier or using more abilities, because some of the top tier Risen appear super early game like for example risen abominations appear early in silvari areas and like risen knights which are supposed to be really really late game risen some of those appear as bosses that they reuse earlier too so it's just kind of all blobbed together and it, it's not as good as it could have been some of the only stuff they properly preserve are like the undead dragons and stuff that you see sweeping around in the skies of all but we're way off topic from blood tide at that point I guess uh, the name of the map as well kind of suggests something of a darker uh, feeling area, the Blood Tide Coast. It reminds me, we just did Dredge Honk Cliffs, and it's a lot like that as well, where if you were a complete outsider to Guild Wars 2, just looking at the map names, you'd read about Dredge Haunt Cliffs and the Blood Tide Coast, and you'd think that this is, you know, quite a grim, scary setting in a way. And perhaps a setting that was perhaps tasting a little bit more like how Guild Wars 1 was, which had, you know, I think a generally grimmer, kind of darker, more realistic vibe to it. But uh, as much as there's lots of Risen on this map, as, as much as, you know, there is strife and oppression from the hands of the Elder Dragons and people are suffering, 
I don't really think it does the name justice, just as Dredge Haunt Cliffs didn't do the name justice. I mean, the Blood Tide Coast, I would love to have actually seen that visually here, you know, actually have some of these channels and waterways swept with blood, you know, because the Risen have attacked in certain areas and an event might be going on that is stained a certain area. You know, in fact, that would be really cool if there was a meta event that kind of did that, stained at all the areas with blood because there's some big leaking Risen Abomination or something that you need to kill. They don't really do any of that. There is one prominent meta event here. It does have a world boss, so kudos to this map for that uh, in terms of Tider Covington. So we've seen a lot of pirates, and pirates are a big part of the story, really, because Lion's Arch is a pirate town, and it's kind of this neutral, chaotic third party that all the individual races, regardless of their individual problems, can meet at and, you know, find some common ground and work together. So there are antagonistic pirates too, uh, and in particular Tida, also known as the Hydra Queen. She's actually really well integrated into the lore all over the game. You know, you get some meta events, like the Svanir Shaman in Wayfarer Foothills on the Ice Lake, and discussion about them and how they affect the world and stuff is really local. They kind of feel like they've just been, like, dropped in with an eyedropper and they don't really make a big splash they're just there on the map but Tida, Tida really kind of spread her wings in terms of the lore and I think is really really well integrated the Modnir High King Olgoth as well would probably be another good example in fact probably an even better example of someone who influences a lot of lore and then suddenly you get this cool meta event where you actually get to take them out that's not the only meta event. The other one was a post-release one for the Triple Trouble Worm. We'll get to that a bit later. Aside from that, I don't really remember too much prominent in terms of guild missions here. I mean, yeah, there's bounties and treks all over the world, but there's no puzzle entrance here. There's no race here either, so slightly less reason to hang around. There's also a good jumping puzzle, which we're actually very close to. If you look on the map right now, that little island off to our west is hollow. You can go inside. There's an... I think it's, a, is it, it's an abandoned Asura Lab where you get a really weird puzzle to complete, like a super weird puzzle. And even to this day, though I've done that successfully many times in my life, the actual mechanics of it always elude me. Like right now, as I sit here doing this video, as much as I like to just have trivia and fun little stories for you guys, I couldn't describe in detail exactly how to beat that. You have to do like weird math stuff, I think, again. Um, but basically the idea is you're trying to open a portal that takes you from underwater inside it. It's hollow and it's underwater. And then it will actually teleport you onto the roof and they, there you can complete it. Nowadays with mounts, there's many ways to skip it and just climb onto the rock straight away. Which feels kind of video gaming and tricky and cool, which I like. Even before mounts, there were some techniques, but I think the devs ended up nerfing them. And now they've just given up because it's just too easy with the griffin and the sky scale and the, uh, the mastery that allows you to leap off of their back really far. You can kind of climb onto a lighthouse nearby and a rock nearby and do all kinds of things to get up there. So yeah, kind of easily skippable. If it appears on the daily, it tends to be pretty good. You'll notice I've been swimming a lot. So uh, that is a big part of this map as well. Uh, obviously, I said I like kind of beachy, watery maps. But the other nice thing about this map, just in general, is it's one of the first heavily underwater influenced experiences in that you do get a lot more swimming here than you did anywhere else. And in fact, you get a lot of big open bodies of water where you can actually swim to the map boundary and you'll get the error message, hey, there's a, there's a heavy current, please turn around, please swim back. I think this was the first time I'd actually experienced that in the game. So get ready for a lot of underwater hearts and just general swimming around experiences. There's also, though, a lot of land stuff. So here we're at a place called Storm Bluff Isle, which is funny, This many of the server names for the game are actually like prominent locations and you know have interesting backstories and stuff and then one of the servers for Guild Wars 2 is Storm Bluff Isle I think it's one of the NA servers maybe it's one of the EU servers and it's referring to this isle here which really there's not much going on here I mean there's a cool uh, hero challenge here where we actually have to fire these cannons and properly aim them at the uh, the barrels over there there's not much UI supporting this, but I actually like that there's not much UI supporting this. You actually have to look at the cannon itself and where it's facing and guess, you know, uh, is that actually going to hit or, you know, through trial and error. And the harder you hold down the button, the higher the cannonball will go and the further it will go. So there you see he gets a nice two for one. So that was pretty efficient. There's a nice lighthouse there. Uh, quite a lot of good dialogue, actually. Some like, decent events where that place gets attacked. You can uh, talk about the Asura that are collaborating nearby in that heart we did underwater dealing with all the Asura stuff to do with them. And then the other cool thing about this, I, I guess... All right, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is something cool about it. This entire thing is hollow that we're standing on. All of it is a massive cave. 
And the cave is hiding the Chantry of Secrets, where the Order of Whispers are based. Or at least the new Chantry of Secrets. This is not the Guild Wars 1 Chantry of Secrets, which was way down south in Alona. When the Order of Whispers came north, they set a new one up here. So if you choose to join this order, not the Vigil, the German Prior, you want to be secretive spies, then this is where you end up coming. You notice the devs quite cunningly did something here as well. All three of the orders are very close to Lion's Arch. Vigil is slightly north, the Dermond Priory is slightly east, and these guys are slightly south. And this map is actually the highest level one, and that's so that people can get access to it from Lion's Arch really easily, and then the Asura Gates and so on. The thing is, and by the way, we're actually getting two map completions and one in this video. You see how we got a map completion chest there? That's because the Chantry of Secrets counts as a map to explore. I know it's crazy. You get way less rewards for it, just a bit of experience. But you have to go inside to get the point of interest that's in there, and then you can immediately leave. The Vigil Keep does not have an equivalent, and the Dermot Priory does not have an equivalent. But the Order of Whispers does. <laughs> Uh, which is just weird and can easily be the, the one you forget, you know, even in the, the modern day people might forget that just because it's a little bit obscure. But yeah, all three of them are designed to be easy for players to get to from around level 30 in Lion's Arch. But this map is actually really quite a high level. So you might wonder, well, how is, is Order of Whispers meant to be the high level order? Well, no, the map is actually really carefully structured such that you can walk out of that south uh, uh, portal from Lion's Arch straight into that cave without much trouble. You know, that fight we did at the entrance of the cave, that was an opt-in fight as a hero challenge. Which, you know, if you're under-leveled, you can even just tag while someone else is doing. But you don't have to fight that. And you can run on through. All of that was very cleverly done, but kind of doesn't matter in the game anymore. You know, it, 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 the personal story was never built in such a way that it really matters. Um, but I, I like that it's still there. I like that we still get that little bit of a sense of it. So yeah, the uh, Order of Whispers, we're not really going to get to see in that cave, but that is where they are hiding. And that's where that beautiful globe is that shows the full Guild Wars uh, 2 map and gave us all those nice sneaky little insights. I have a very strong memory of actually finding this in one of the pre-release betas. Was it the press? Like, out? I think the press beta was technically like still an alpha. Was it that? I remember finding this and... And being kind of scared to make a video about it because it felt so obscure. In fact, in Lion's Arch itself, there is a massive jumping puzzle with loads of voice acting that was actually blocked off in one of the betas. But a player found out how to sneak behind it and did a YouTube video of it. And I remember that really clearly as well. And feeling like, oh my god, should I do a video as well? Or do the devs not want us to see these things? I did do the, the uh, sneak peek at the Order of Whispers video in the end. And I remember that it didn't get as much viewership as I thought it would. Oh, that sounds tacky. I don't mean viewership. It didn't It didn't stir people in, in the way that I thought it would. I mean, to me, it was this super mind-blowing thing. This crazy cool globe in there. And, you know, the return of the Order of Whispers. And look, they built a new Chantry, guys. But I guess the majority of the user base at that time didn't care that much about the story or know that much about the story and it just wasn't that important to them that we had seen all of Tyria on this big globe and it was the secret room. To them I guess it just looked like a cave because aside from the big slightly, you know, oscillating orb, there's not really much going on in there is there? But yeah, I do, I do remember that very clearly. This area I quite like, even though it can sort of just be a generic kill event, there are nice opportunities to interact with the, the pirates, throw water buckets on them when they're passed out and stuff. And I know that's kind of just copied over from the Norn stuff, but it, it works well. There's also some nice events here. So immediately to the south, there are some really cool event chains where you do some escorts through some swamps of some pirates looking for buried treasure and some other people on a bit of an adventure. And... If you do both, and they're like two separate event chains that f fire at different times, essentially. But if you do both of them, you realize that in one of the storylines, like this one here, Save the Merchants from the Bloody Buccaneer ca Kidnappers. If you did that one, you'll find that the merchants like leave some chests around at one place or create a campfire or whatever, and then they move on. And if you stick about like half an hour later when the other event's going on, if you're still in that area of the world and you do it, you'll find the other characters interact with the chest that's been left on the ground. Now, I'm, I'm kind of just pulling that example out of thin air here. I can't remember the precise object it is. Maybe you guys can remind me in the comments. But there's this really nice, like, natural weaving in of the stories there that I think is really strong about dynamic events. I've talked a lot in this series, like, what was really working with dynamic events? What what should they have taken further forwards? And, and that, too, I think really, really was, was something brilliant that you just don't get enough of anywhere in Guild Wars 2, not even in the expansions and stuff. I think ArenaNet nowadays 
they don't really do the there's two event chains overlapping in the same area thing much because it's better to spend their resources making sure the whole map is canvassed rather than like this overlap thing but where they do the overlap thing they also very rarely have them interact you know you can think of a map like the silver waste or something from season two where there's constantly events everywhere firing everywhere but they don't have that like little flavorful lore interaction and it feels really natural and really realistic and emergent and it doesn't have in terms of how it's coded it's obviously not actually a dynamic interaction but it works super well and i'd love to see them do more of that you know if, if they were ever going to refine the system be that a part of a sequel or whatever if they wanted to double down on dynamic events that that is that is a lesson to learn i think anyway this is more of the swamp itself that was the heart area Let's talk a little bit about Guild Wars 1, because we haven't shown Shaman's map up. This, once again, is a location, here's the map, that doesn't have much overlap with Guild Wars 1. I've actually expanded the crop on this a little bit. So, what you can see is up at the very north, it does overlap with the Guild Wars 1 mission. That's the Gates of Kryter, but the Gates of Kryter didn't really look like this in Guild Wars 1. It's weird to think you could enter the Order of Whispers cave in the Guild Wars 1 Gates of Kryter mission, in a way, because they do overlap. But beyond that, the rest of the map's pretty much empty, so it's kind of close to the Fields of Ruin. Not quite so crazy as that map, though. Uh, I did crop it, though, as well, because you can see way out into the water to the west, there's that place, the D'Alessio Arena. And that has not really returned in Guild Wars 2 in any way. So the D'Alessio Arena, even by Guild Wars 1 standards, is a really obscure place that most people never map, you know, mapped out. And that's because that was a PvP arena that got shut down very very soon after launch. So you used to be able to go to Ascalon for an arena, then Yaxbend for an arena in the Shiver Peaks. Then when you got to Kryta, there was a third arena, the third arena that you accessed from Lion's Arch. You could take a boat over there and you could you could map it out. But then it got closed down. You can't take the boat. You can't go anywhere near there. You can't even, like some of the other ones, like Fort Kogi, you can break out of the map in clever ways and still like map. This one, you cannot unfuck. So it's not there. It doesn't count for like the cartography title in Guild Wars 1 or any of that. Uh, but when they ported the maps over to Guild Wars 2, that island is still there, in theory. And in a weird way, you can get under that island. It's not Claw Island, by the way. Claw Island is to the north. They are separate islands. The Delesio Arena Island is not Claw Island. In theory, you can get there by uh, going to the Fractal Hub. If you get the pass for the Fractal Lobby, then where that is actually technically located is in the mist as far as the lore is concerned but as far as the game is concerned you're at the delessio arena and when you press m on the map you'll see that so i kind of wanted to bung that bit of trivia here into this blood tide coast episode because i don't know where else i'd put it in and it's kind of one of those weird 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 little facts and because mechanically it's where the delessio arena is i don't know I, I think that might mean we never get it in guild wars 2 maybe this is a beautiful cave, by the way. One of the stunning areas. If I have ever... I think I did a montage showing off my re reshade preset once upon a time. And um, and I think I used this cave because this is such a beautiful little area. It's one of the real, real treats. Visual treats of the whole game. So another thing about Blood Tide that is really striking to me, especially looking at the Guild Wars 1 maps, is that realistically... There shouldn't be this much land here. I know we talked there's a bit of a balance with underwater and land. A balance I expect Edge of Dragon, End of Dragons to match, by the way. This is about the limit of underwater influence I would expect in End of Dragons. Maybe like one big Path of Fire sized map that feels kind of proportioned how Blood Tide Coast is. That's probably what I think they'll aim for. But uh, here's the thing. In lore, this whole region's kind of weird. Because in lore, this is the Sea of Sorrows as far as the original game is concerned and it should be nearly entirely water so i was surprised coming here in guild wars 2 to find that there's a mu as much land as there is now and i guess that's because the devs weren't confident doing you know even more so a lot of these land masses have kind of just sort of popped up out of nowhere in the sequel game uh the delessio arena was really surrounded by a lot of water before and now there's a lot of land around i mean yes there we are kind of on the coast with the shiver peaks near us and that's something Blood Tide Coast could have done better as well. Really give us the sense that we're on like a mountainous coast. You know, kind of a Japan style thing. But I don't really get that feeling here. You know, we're actually walking along the uh, eastern flank of the map right now. And if I look up, I don't see mountains. And that kind of sucks a little bit. Uh, but yeah, they kind of constructed a lot of land. That's true to the south map as well that we'll see in, uh, very soon on the playlist. Uh, Sparkfly Fen. 
And uh, it's true as well with the post-release update where they dumped South Sun Cove in, which appears absolutely enormous on the, on the world map to the extent that I've never really believed that, unless it's like a major retcon, that the scale of that map can be correct. That maybe there's like a... You know, people always wonder, what is the true scale of Tyria? Is it, you know, for every step I take in game, am I taking a mile in, in, in like the real, in the lore, in the actual proper thing? It's just that the game can't give us the true scale. People always wonder that, myself too, but I think there can't be any one scale. Because a place like South Sun Cove is so big and it just kind of messes with the geography of what this should be like a, an, a, a sea, really. And look at us. Where we are right now is a very cool place. It's time for me to talk about the Triple Trouble Worm. Also, Tech Zoom actually cutting a little bit here. We haven't really seen any cuts on the series so far, but here you go. So, the coast is clear of Great Worm attacks. <clears throat> After release, ArenaNet was playing with the concept of hardcore endgame PvE that involved killing massive bosses, but they didn't want to put them in the dungeons. They wanted big zergs dealing with them, and they didn't have, like, the raiding format implemented, and I'm not sure they knew if they wanted to go for that yet. This was all before Heart of Thorns. So what they did was they tried to make big world bosses that were these epic, super challenging encounters designed for 150 people. And there were two bosses, two patches that really introduced this concept. One was a rework of a big dragon boss in an upcoming episode in this playlist. And another was that they introduced this, the Triple Trouble Worm. Now this was a format that really captured me. And with both of these bosses, I really spent like probably thousands of hours learning how to beat them, commanding how to beat them, and later optimizing them. Uh, really, a lot of the strategies for how to fight this boss, uh, I was there brainstorming and figuring out amongst very, very few people. These were so difficult that only a couple of servers on the NA region, in fact, only one server on the NA region, was even able to attempt it. And I think maybe there were a couple of servers on EU. EU tends to do better at the game. I've just always played on the NA side. And EU actually beat us for world first by a, a couple of hours, I think it was, on this particular event. So I really fell in love with this and I could talk for hours and hours and hours in specific about the event itself. This one was really good because ArenaNet realized if you have 150 players all fighting the same creature at once, the game gets really laggy. That's both FPS lag and network latency. So it's just a terrible idea. Also, people get memory crashes and it's just a nightmare. So on this one, they'd split the full fight into three separate fights that must happen at once. And they've all got to be coordinated together. You've got to kill the bosses at the same time. Otherwise, if one person kills a boss too early, the others will regenerate. But they have all these complicated mechanics and timings involved to actually make the bosses vulnerable. So there's got to be like basically three groups of 50 across very different areas of the map. They added big escorts to get there, but it generally starts in this area. Uh, it's a fantastic event. Nowadays, people know it very well. Nowadays, there's a lot more power creep thanks to condition stacking updates and ferocity updates later. So it's totally doable. I recommend people try it, uh, but I have very, very, very fond memories of it, just as I have very fond memories of the other patch. All that said, it was a really wonky format because... It was kind of super hard and made for the 150 people in a way. Or at least when people didn't know how to do it and gear was bad, you kind of wanted the full 150. Uh, that's map cap. No one else can be in the map at that point. So if you wanted to play it, you had to go through these horrendous, horrible situations where you'd have to like join someone on a party and keep right-clicking their, their, their name and trying to join on their instance and then the, everything would stall and then it would say it's full and then you have to join on their instance and it would stall and it would say it was full and you'd have to do that for like half an hour straight. I actually have a whole video just bitching about this experience. It's very rare for me to do a video like that, but I have a, a video that is just me sitting there right-clicking and uh, entering that, and I think I have some Elder Scrolls music going on in the background, and that's it. And I wanted to see if anyone would actually watch the whole thing. And the point was to show how annoying that whole process was. But I actually had a lot of people watch the full video, this boring video where I have no content. It's just that. But people were watching it because uh, the music I put on was too nice. Damn you, Jeremy Soul. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, there were all these problems with it, and all this animosity and toxicity, therefore. Because when you've got this situation where a guild is trying to beat it, and they desperately need their good players in. 
but they can't get in because there's 150 and you don't know 40 of them. All of a sudden, you find people shouting down, you know, the random players who had just happened to be in the map and now found a big Zerg and they want to play and they're, they're allowed, they should be allowed to play. You know, it basically turned open world, which is supposed to be a very inclusive, easy and free thing where everyone's happy to see everyone. You know, that's so important to Guild Wars 2. It turned open world into uh, this very gross, very toxic environment. People talk about toxicity when it comes to raids and fractals and stuff. I'm telling you, they don't know anything they're talking about. They're just whiners, all right? The real toxicity was situations like this. At least when they finally moved to a proper raiding format and when they, you know, really dived into the fractals format you can control who's there because they're in instances you can have who you want and it's designed for like attainable party sizes this was just insane i remember i went days and days and days just like sleeping in two hour batches because the boss if you failed the boss you couldn't respawn it for another two hours that was another problem with the format so and they kind of fixed that with guild missions to an extent but not too well uh, so I would like go to sleep for two hours, wake up and try and grind them again because we were so desperate for that uh, initial world first. Uh, so by the way, also that heart that I was just at, that is a heart I've referenced many times over this playlist. That heart is the alchemy heart where you really can't kill things. I'm, I'm astounded to see. Did you guys see how quickly Tech Zoom just beat that? He did it in like an instant. He knows exactly how to beat that. You could spend a long time there fiddling around with what ingredients need to go in what cages at what time. That was incredible. He beat that so fast. Look at that. Wow. The, I do map completion so rarely that by the time I come back to that, I've forgotten the specific mechanics and what goes where. I suppose overlay software would help you with that one. But that was amazing. I'm really happy to see that. Also, that heart back there, that's where one of the worms would spawn. The other one would be like way off on the left of the map. The other one would be kind of central to the map. So you can really get a sense of how far away they were. It's just this really cool feeling of like all these players coming together in all these different areas of the map to fight one common enemy. It was badass. Very, very, very cool. The spectacle to it was in insane. You get that spectacle from some other places as well. There's a temple in Or that we will visit later, the Temple of Lissa, and that meta event I've always thought was probably the best meta event they ever made, and I would have loved a rework for that. But then they moved away from the idea of reworks, really. Uh, at least reworks that were designed to be uh, enjoyed as hardcore endgame stuff. Uh, so yeah, we you just saw us down a, a very deep, very scary hole. That place is actually pretty dangerous. Mass Invis did a lot of work for us there. Uh, I remember first finding that. It's like just a gaping abyss deep down under the water. And uh, I don't know why it's really there. The devs just wanted to get a bit more texture, a, a bit of a point of interest, so to speak. Not as in the mechanic point of interest, but, you know, an actual point of interest. Just to divert, give a little bit of flavor to what this is. Essentially a big body of water here. This is a big open body. Most of the minimap is all water here, which is nice. And we're even at the very south of the map, which should lead to the next, but there'll be fierce currents that don't uh, allow us to go any further. It's a scary area. I wonder whether maybe one day they had thought they were going to do underwater dragon stuff there, you know. But then they didn't have time to implement any of it, so we just get crate there instead. That might be a reason why there's a lot of crate around too, you know. Maybe at one point there were going to be... I've always called them the drenched. I don't know what they'll actually be called, but I've always called the underwater dragon minions the drenched. And if you watch my uh, sci-fi Stellaris Let's Play, uh, you'll see that I have Guild Wars 2 stuff going on with that, and, and I'm against the drenched in that, which is very, very cool. This beach here as well, this is where the Cobalt Worm would spawn. So Cobalt was... As I said, everyone had to split into three chunks. Cobalt was the chunk that I was commanding first and playing first and learning first. So Cobalt is kind of like my favorite in a way. Well, it's not really my favorite. I think the best one is Crimson, which was over near the Alchemy Heart, where they have a whole thing where the uh, the worm will actually swallow you and you grab an environmental object in there and you hack your way out along with your, you know, 40 other friends while a few other people tactically stay outside and keep harassing him from the back. It's really, really, really cool. Brilliant uh, worm, that one. But yeah, Cobalt is where I spent a lot of time. I have a lot of memories of doing the escort here. Or taking just a couple of people to do the escort so it wouldn't scale up too bad because those escorts scaled to an insane degree. So you have just a couple of people do it. That way people don't lose their bloodlust stacks. And there was a cool trick because this map's got so much underwater combat. We would be encouraging people to get bloodlust weapons on their underwater stuff. So they would go underwater, stack 25 bloodlust. And then come out of the water and their terrestrial weapons would have other sigils like force sigils and accuracy sigils. And so now you've got bloodlust and force and accuracy. And then it's a game do not die during the event so that you get all the full damage for everything. 
And of course, another big mechanic I haven't even talked about is how the meta would phase at the end into a whole other boss fight. But all three fights were connected in how they scaled. And this final phase had bosses that moved really fast. So if one of them moved out of event range, the whole event would scale down and the other players would experience these massive burn phases. And we never knew whether that was just that we were doing a mechanic right or everyone had started playing really well or what. And then it turned out to be this horrendous bug that had thrown us off and had, you know, caused us to win or fail so many times. Good times. Meanwhile, over here on this uh, flank of the map now, as we travel up the western wall, uh, there really won't be so much to do. There's a cool location here I used to grind some achievements on. Uh, this particular area is uh, dealing with the Hylic, defending them from some of the Risen. Help shore up their uh, defenses. I don't really remember them saying very much, but there is a nice escort that takes you to like a Griffin area, I think. Dredge Hat Isle, it's an island that looks a bit like a Dredge Hat, which I guess is cool. It's weird to hear the word Dredge when we're in this place, you know. I really do think of Dredge only when it comes to mountainous areas. And yet, uh, of course, we were even fighting Dredge on this map, which is kind of amazing, honestly. Uh, but yeah, so this island here, uh, fight the mysterious Quag and afflic Affliction. So I think this is meant to be Zaitan related or Risen related. But basically, there's a pestilence in this area, and you can do many different things to help people, including killing all of these little crows that are flying around and maybe there's some rats around as well yeah there are now because they're tied to the heart arena net put a lot of them here and they respawn very fast as well also as they are not regular mobs they're just ambient creatures they die in one hit so what that meant was this was always a particularly good place to grind weapon slayer achievements Why? So, for example, once upon a time I came here and I put my ranger with a torch, stood next to them and had him auto-casting the bonfire skill, skill 5, where I know some crows will spawn. And the crows don't walk around either, they don't move. So, I would just have it there, like, all night, slowly getting up bonfire kills. Or maybe you could do a similar thing on the guardian, uh, trying to use the shield skills, you know, the shield 4. Or whatever. I actually didn't do it with shield. I think some of them couldn't be automated. Uh, but I did that for many weapons. I think I came here on a thief with a short bow as well. And the little short bow projectile would bounce around. I actually know a staggering amount of useless information. Specifically how to tag these. See, the way that their AI is coded is... You see how they, they spawn in bundles? If you attack one in the bundle... But don't hit the other ones in the bundle... The other ones will fly off. So then you get like a, maybe a period of half a second... To execute another attack and kill the other ones while they're flying away. And there's like little things that can make them invulnerable. So you've really got to position yourself just right to hit them. And that's why bouncing attacks were really good with the Thief Short Bow. But yeah, I spent a lot of time on that beach <laughs> overall uh, in my time playing this game. Tech Zoom uh, actually beat the heart in the same way that I would. You know, I, And the other nice thing is a lot of the time with hearts, when you beat the hearts, all the objectives go away for your character on your client. So, for example, do you remember in Diesa Plateau where we had that garden? When you finally finish the garden, if you pay attention to the environment, you'll see in all the flower beds everywhere else, all the weeds go away and all the, all the, the flowers sprout up and it all looks very nice all at once. It all kind of appears there. That's because you've done the heart now. So they kind of just, to you know, toggle everything into a complete state for you. But when it comes to enemies attacking an area, they can't do that. They can't just instantly kill all the enemies. Because for another player, looking on, they just see everything randomly die for some reason. And imagine if there's like five players doing the heart at once. There's going to be all these weird, awkward moments where everything dies. And it, it would just be terrible. So they can't do that. And so those ambient creatures are enemies. And so they won't go away even after you finish the heart, which means you can beat the heart and just keep grinding your Weapon Slayer stuff at the same time. Oh, hit the keyboard a little bit there. But yeah, so that's it, really. Um, more underwater stuff here. We get a heart to do with the Quaggan. I have a strong memory from the Alphas in this area. You see this point of interest we're going to here, Brikiki Lee? That's a Quaggan hatchery. Um, where under this rock, and it's kind of a hidden area, especially again in a world where you weren't being telegraphed to go to all the POIs, uh, you can go in and see that they're taking care of all these little quaggin. There's a there's a quaggin that sings in there, I think. It's all very sweet and very nice. Back in the alphas, or in the betas, sorry, uh, this cave actually had a merchant in it. It might still have a merchant. So look at all the little quaggin calves. Very cute, by the way. Quaggan babies don't really get the fanfare they're used to. I, I'm kind of take it or leave it about the Quaggan themselves. 
Uh, I'd be much more into the Quaggan themselves if their enrage mode was still being emphasized. But Quaggan babies, I've got to admit, are pretty cool. Uh, they're very cute. And anyway, that was that's one of the first places I guess people really get to see a lot of them. Anyway, there used to be a merchant in there. Maybe there still is and they just don't sell this thing anymore. But back during the betas, and even, no, 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 this was even during the early actual launch, because I have them on my account. These merchants sold gem store boosters. So you know how on the gem store you can buy like a strength booster and an armor booster and a regen booster and a speed booster? Those, first of all, I kind of loathe. I think that kind of stuff should never have existed on the gem store. And it's one of the great, for all the random stupid nonsense that this community whines about, the fact that there was absolutely no conversation at all, let alone outrage or whatever, there was no conversation about those boosters being on sale at launch. It's just mind-blowing to me. That was so, so, so bad. That's one of the biggest gem store mishaps they've ever had. And it's been one of the most persistent ones too. Nobody talks about it. Anyway, they, I guess at one point, ArenaNet wanted to have those as available purchases just throughout the game world. And they used to come in tiers. So there was like Strength Booster Tier 1 that you could buy like in Queensdale somewhere, maybe. And then there was T2 that was maybe in Kessex and T3 and so on. Anyway, like the T4 one, you could buy here on this map in that little hatchery. And the, while the devs had tried to delete them all from the game, they'd forgotten some places. And that was one of them. I think I have four of those items and I still have them to this day in my bank. And I'll never consume them because they're such special old items to me. Laughing Gold Island here, by the way, is where we fight Tida. Brilliant map. Love it. Full of memories for me. Thanks very much for watching, guys, and I'll see you for the next episode on the playlist. Drop your memories and stuff down below. I keep talking too much. I'm running out of footage. Thanks, guys. See you on the next one.